Welcome to the Selling in the Motor Trade podcast in association with Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice tips and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bogert. Now, some of you probably already know me as Skippy. I want to start by saying thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Firstly, I want to say thank you to everyone that's hitting that subscribe button. Uh, the more people hit the subscribe button, the more people are actually getting to listen to all the content. And you know, the whole idea of this podcast is sharing tips and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve the sales and after sales side of the business, or in America, service and parts. And today we've got someone talking about the parts and the service side of the business. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Cowan from Pro Talk. It's Jeff Cowan's Pro Talk. Hi, Jeff. How are you? How are you doing, sir? Very good. Thank you. Very good. Now, to start off with, some people who may not know you. Jeff, we met at the NADA conference. Uh, Patrick Tessier, uh, part of the Australian Automotive Dealers Association, he has his study tour every year. Uh, we're at one of his meals. Uh, I've heard you speak at the NADA conference, but for people who don't know you, can you uh, tell us a little bit about how many times you spoke at the NADA conference and um, a bit of your background there? Well, yeah, when it, when it, as, as, as it pertains to NADA, uh, they refer to me as a partner, which just basically means we recommend each other services, right? But the convention itself, I've spoken at 22 times out of the last 36 years. Um, I love it, love doing it every single time. We're going to apply to speak there again next year. Uh, if you know much about the NADA, uh, you know that they have what they call dealer 20 groups. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken at, they've told me this, that I've spoken at more uh, dealer 20 groups than uh, all other speakers combined. I constantly wow. do that. When it comes to the speaking at, speaking at the event for 22 years, I think I'm the, I, I don't think there's anybody that's done it more than me. That's, yeah. it's, nobody that's active has done more than me. So it's always a good time. You know, you get to meet a lot of nice people like yourself. Yeah, it, I always love to go there and see what's new, what's fresh, what ideas out there. Um, and it's um, it's great to bump into so many like-minded people. Um, so can I ask, how did you get started in the motor trade? Well, you know, I come from a strong uh, selling background. You know, I, I had I sold other products and, and, and whatnot. And um, I actually had started... Uh, my company, Jeff Cowan's Pro Talk, in very early, very early stages of it. And uh, as a matter of fact, it wasn't called Jeff Cowan's Pro Talk then. And I was in a networking meeting and I was I was talking to a lady and telling her I was doing sales training stuff. And she said, hey, a really good friend of mine is a car dealer here in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I lived at the time and where I was born and raised. And she said, he loves training. Let me connect you with him. So we did. And then very quickly, I started working with him. We, I started mm -hmm. selling cars for him, uh, went in and, and, and you know created a training program and the like. And then through that relationship, uh, selling cars, he came to me and he said, you know, you're really good at what you do. And we like your training and we like your ability to move cars. Uh, I think the future is going to be fixed operations or, or aftermarket sales. He said so. Um, and it's funny because you'll find out here in a second, there was two different motives going on. He said, so I'd like for you to go out on, on one of our service drives and write service and create a selling process. He said, because we don't sell anything. He said, nobody sells anything. Mm. And I said, sure. And he says, and then once you create the process, if you want, then you can go sell it to anybody else you want to, but I want to see what you can do. So I went out and uh, worked on the service drive for, for over a year. And in the meantime, put together a sales training program and very, but, but very quickly when writing service for him within the first month out of, out of eight service advisors that the, the driver was on, I went to number one. And it's because I was doing the walk around, I was selling and mm -hmm. taking the approach. Mm -hmm. So I developed a program. And at the time I didn't realize that his end game was, is he wanted me to, to come on full time with him mm -hmm. and, and, you know, be like a fixed operations director. But I went to him about just over a year and I said, look, I've got this training program. And as you can see, it worked for me. It's working for, you know, the dealership I'm writing service at. And we actually installed it in his 14 other dealerships. And I said, it's knocking out of the park there. I'm going to go sell it. And so okay. I did. And so I got, I went and got the basic uh, experience and, and uh, put it in place and went and sold it. It's been great ever since. Cool. So listen, if I've got this right, I understand that you sold uh, lots of things, furniture, uh, cars, um, you worked in the service side and that explains that. Can I ask you, are there any skills, you're a salesperson through and through, are there any skills you learned from selling other things that's 
as relevant in the service department as it is uh, selling furniture. Oh yeah, it, it, so, selling furniture was 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 really you know I'd sold a couple of products before that, but that was when I got that job. It was really my first true what I consider professional sales job, and I I phrase it that way because this company definitely had a process. They definitely had a company wide training program. And they had a system and they were very and, and they taught it to you. And you had to go through two or three weeks of the training before you could even talk to a customer. And they held you account, they held you accountable to it. I mean, there was no going and put it in your own words, any of that stuff. And so working there, I worked there for a number of years and and uh, at one time was the number one furniture salesperson in the United States. And what I learned from there that you could carry on to other places was, for example, handwritten thank you notes, telling somebody thank you for, for buying something from you or telling somebody thank you for not buying something, just give me the opportunity mm -hmm. to talk to you. That carried over. The presentation part of it, because when it when it came to selling furniture, you know, the, 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 the thing was, is you could just point at it and say, you know, hey, you said you wanted a new chair. There's five of them. Which one do you want? But what they taught us to do was to show the chair, you know, walk around the chair, show how it's made, you know, point out the benefit, you know, the features, the advantages and the benefits. And so that directly related to, you know, the aftermarket sales, because, you know, again, you walk around the car in a service drive, you look for things, you point it out and you you, you talk about the, the features, advantages and benefits. Uh, so that that applied closing sales and handling objections from that industry applied to what we're doing on the service drive. And, and, and then finally, you know, uh, again, just kind of off the top of my head, there's two other areas, actually, uh, when it comes to selling furniture, there was a lot of phone work, you know, mm -hmm. in, involved. And so I, I, I nailed that, and that definitely applied to the service drive. But if I brought it down to one thing, I'd say the biggest thing I learned about selling furniture that carried on to everything else I've done, especially after market sales, was building the relationship. Mm. You know, every time you talk to a customer, it's not a one and done thing. It can be a one and done thing. But if you do it right, you can build a relationship to the point where those people will come back and wait hours if if they have to, and they shouldn't have to, but they wait hours to talk to you. Does that make sense? Oh, so true. I, my first service manager said, Simon, your job is to make sure you turn people into key chuckers. Now, I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, but the key chucker is where someone chucks the keys at you and says, there you go, Jeff, whatever the car needs, just get it done. I'll be exactly. back at six. And you only develop key chuckers over building that relationship. They trust you. They trust everything right. you're going to do. So uh, it's definitely that people business. That's what it's all about, isn't it? it yeah, really it really is. And that, that's that's what I think, you know, uh, uh, not to get, a, you know, to get ahead of us here, but that's one of the things that I think is missing right now in the car business is is there they seem to be just gung ho on becoming Amazon where you don't have to talk to customers, so you know, and you don't have to you don't have to interface with them. And even on the service drive, you know, we're seeing a lot of that stuff coming about. Yeah. And what the, what they're missing is is that even Amazon doesn't want to be Amazon anymore. Amazon understands that salespeople keep you know have have key thing, and you'll like this stat, and I think your listeners will too, that even though so much business is done online it looks like everything is done online right now as we're sitting here filming that you know doing this podcast is is 87 percent of any cell that's made in the world still requires face-to-face -face, eyeball to eyeball and or voice to voice contact and of the 13 percent who buy their stuff online half of those people won't take delivery of the product or service until they talk to somebody okay. so the more, you know, the more you focus on the relationship and the interaction between, you know, in, in our case here, the service advisor and the customer, the more successful you're going to be. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Well, we're talking about the after sales, as we call it in the, in the UK and Ireland and lots of places right. in Europe, service and parts and fixed operations. Um, and that's what we want to talk about. But if we have a look at the car sales side for a second, over here, we've got companies like um, uh, Kazoo. Over there, you have Carvana, where if you look right. at their share price, over the last 12 months, what is it, 90 odd percent they've slid um, because people still want to go in there and speak to people, I think. Um, I really do think that's the change. And I, I love that stat. 87 percent of people still want to do things, transact with people. Um, yeah. I was, great stat. Uh, no, no, I was just saying great stat. Uh, listen, the next thing I want to ask is uh, with the service advisors, um, right. Sometimes in a business, they're almost seen as the um, the forgotten part of the business. Uh, right. You sold cars as well. And, you know, you right. started selling cars first. And then it was like, go and have a look at the service department, almost right. as an afterthought. And uh, again, something I was taught by my first service manager. He said, Simon, never forget, car salespeople, they only sell the first car. 
it's the service people. They sell the second, the third, the ongoing sale. And I think it's so true. How often have you been on that counter and the customer comes up and says, hey, Jeff, that new hybrid technology, is it any good or not? Because Bob in sales is telling me is, but you'll tell me the truth there. I want right. to ask, is that attitude changing it? Because listen, I've been in the motor trade since I was 17 years old. I'm 49 now, so that's too many years. But <laughs> that was the attitude when I first started. Is it changing or is it still there, do you think? No, I think I think the, the service advisor has a tremendous uh, effect on whether or not that customer is going to mm. buy that second car at that dealership, you know, because because it, like you said, the salesperson sees them once the service advisor sees them anywhere, depending on the vehicle and, and how it's driven two to four times a year. So the, the customer just drives that car for three years. That's 12 times, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, but I even take it a step further because, you know, that's that's always been one of the things. Sell sells the first one, service sells the second. But service can also cost you the second because, yeah. you know, if you don't have a service advisor that knows how to walk around the car, how to interact with the customer, build a relationship and get the sale, then here's what happens. The vehicle, the the, customer, the client gets the vehicle, they drive it for 100,000 kilometers uh, and, and they look back over the 100,000 kilometers and they say, you know, when the salesperson sold me this, he said that I'd never have to do anything to it. You know, but it, well, let me back up for a second. So they come in, they drive it for hundred thousand miles, but or thousand, hundred thousand kilometers, and the whole time they're driving it, the service advisor never upsells them on the preventative maintenance, never helps them out with the repairs and the like. So then, at the end of that hundred thousand kilometers, the customer looks back and says, "Hey, I'm getting ready to buy a new car, and I don't know if I want one of these because the salesperson told me this one would last me, you know, with for hundred thousand kilometers and cost me almost no money, but the last two years alone has cost me two or three thousand dollars, you know, to keep it running. So why would I want to go back and buy another one? Now it cost them that much because they never did the service, but the customer will never admit that. So they go someplace else because they don't see the value. But at the flip side, if you've got a service advisor that knows how to build that relationship and sells them what they need all along the way, the oil changes, the maintenance, the repairs, and the tires and all that stuff. Then at 100,000 kilometers, the customer looks back and says, you know what? Uh, the salesperson told me if I took care of this car, and I did, that I should be able to drive at 100,000 100, kilometers with, with, with little or no expense. And that really happened. So I think I'm going to go back and get another one because obviously this is a great car. So yes, they can sell the second car if they're selling the customer the whole time the, you know, they're driving the vehicle. Um, the preventative maintenance, the repairs as they're needed. And, and that's that's where I think a lot of it falls apart because most advisors I've met don't know how to sell or they won't sell. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I've got to say thank you very much for changing from miles to kilometers, but don't, don't panic. Really hard. Uh, in the UK, we're <laughs> miles as well. So uh, okay. in the UK audience, miles they're happy with. Um, there's okay. kilometers in <laughs> Ireland and Australia, so don't panic. Canada, I don't know about Canada. I've never worked there. Are they miles or kilometers? They're, they're kilometers. So uh, just, okay. So it's they're one kilometers. Of those, they're, I, I think they're kilometers in Australia too, aren't they? Oh, they definitely are. Now, I grew up in Australia, so I know they're definitely kilometers there. So I, I do think metric there, but uh, living in the UK now, miles is fine. So thank you for that. I try, I try to do my homework and you can see here over on this wall, you know, I'm a big, big fan I of- I love Britain. that. Because oh. that is Dan Weldon and he's from Great Britain and he won the Indianapolis 500 uh, twice. Oh, very you good. Know, that's, his, that's his car, so- well, I, I'm going to talk about that in a second because there's a book I understand that you've written. But before I get into that, I want to go one stage further with about the importance of that service sure. advisor. But um, there's something else that it was on one of your NADA conferences. I'm pretty sure it was yourself, sir. was talking about let's just look at the gross that a service advisor brings into the dealership compared to a really good car salesperson. I mean, a really good car salesperson is going to find it super hard to sell more than one car a day. OK, right. uh, and, and that's a great, great salesperson. You compare to the gross you make out of that one car. Now, that's great at the moment. But you compare to how many customers does that service advisor speak to every day? OK, how many times right. if you just look at it, you pick up the calculator there and work out the difference between the two. It's immense. So sometimes how much development are we doing for that service advisor? Sometimes the car sales where we get the, the 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 trip and the new car gets launched and they send them to Barcelona when the car's launched and sometimes the service advisors they, they don't get the same attention. Well, yeah, they, they almost never get the attention. They're the forgotten people. You know, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the average service advisor, they're writing up uh, at least here stateside 15 customers a day. Yeah. So that, that's more than, you know, so 15 customers a day, 75 a week, 300 a month. And that's and the, the average salesperson will only talk to 50 to 60 people in a, in over here, 50 to 60, maybe 75 people a month. Yeah. Okay. 
So yep. this this advisor has more Same. impact not only on your sales, but your survey scores, the customer retention, the effective labor rate, hours per repair order, and, and the amount of heat that you're going to deal with, and ultimately the car sales. And they get almost zero training. And what's sad about that is that you know not only do they get training so they can help build the, the you know the the dealership and and uh, the the brand and and the gross profits and stuff, um, but but it causes them to leave because we hire them and, and we're hoping that we're you know we hire somebody that knows how to sell you know knight in shining armor type of gig, and and so we never really train them to be successful but we want them to be successful and it just it, to me it never makes any sense I mean I never get that. Um, listen, people are listening to this podcast. Jeff just showed us a, a photograph of an ND500 uh, picture on the wall there. Yeah. And um, well, I, I, people who know us and know the podcast will know that I'm into Formula One a lot. So this right. is a couple of books I need to talk to you about. Uh, the first book I need to talk to you about, The Right Service and Write Your Own Paycheck. Okay. Um, hey, that's the book right there. Again, people um, who can't, who are listening to this podcast, it's Right Service and Write Your Own Paycheck, uh, available on Amazon or go to Jeff's website and get that. Uh, and a, a great, all about how to improve the service department. But I have to ask you the question. The book that caught my attention, maybe because I love Formula One, is what I've learned about attending over 35 ND 500 races. Is yeah. that right? Is that the book? And you have to tell me yeah. about that. There's got to be a story it, there. Yeah, there, there, is. There, is, there is a story. And I live in Southern California because that's where I met my my, my uh, the, the woman of my dreams. And and uh, even though I told her I'd never live in California, you know how it goes when you get married, if you're married. Yeah. Oh, uh, it, oh, that's why an Australian lives in the UK at the moment. I've done the same thing, Jeff. <laughs> same thing. But this this book, it's it's I'm going to brag here for a second. It's it's the number one selling business book ever written about the Indianapolis 500. The Indianapolis 500, for your viewers, just in case they don't know, is the biggest single day sporting event in the world. On race day, they will have somewhere between 350 and 400,000 people in the grandstands. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another 50 million people reportedly or, or another uh, 100 million people reportedly watch it live around on the, 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 the world. Uh, this one is, is entitled 35 Indy 500s. I'm updating it, republishing it here literally in three weeks, and it's going to be what I've learned from attending 40 Indy 500s. So the book has done very, very well. And the reason it has is because it's, it's life lessons and motivation, leadership, sales, management, life in general. So what I do is I take an event that happened on the track, and, and there's there's a lot in it about Dan Weldon, who's one of my favorite drivers. He's from Great Britain. They called him Lionheart. Uh, won two Indy 500s and unfortunately uh, later passed away in a race in Las Vegas. And I happened to be there when that happened. It was really sad. Mm -hmm. But what I do is I take an event that happened on the track and explain, you know, what I learned from, you know, what what I what I saw there. And then the next part of the book, the next part of the chapter will be here's the lesson learned. And then I apply a personal story to it, how I used it in the selling world, how I used mm -hmm. it in the management world, how the leadership. And then they ch each chapter ends with points to ponder. And so it's been hugely popular. And, and uh, you know, it's always exciting because now I get to go to the Indy 500 where they sell the book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the museum there. And I and usually one or two or if not three of the teams will hire me to do a big speech at the Indy 500 and, and whatnot. But there's a lot I learned from watching uh, from from watching the Indy 500 about life, and that's one of the things I do in my workshops. Is I as I tell people, you know, keep your eyes open. You know, if you're watching television, what can you take away from that? If you're with your kids, what can you take away from that? If you're watching, you know, cricket, I'm, I'm working oh, hard here. You, you're doing really well. We're impressed with that. <laughs> What's funny yeah. is I, I have to explain what cricket is to our audience in Ireland now because it's funny enough. And I'm only joking for lovely people in Ireland. You know, I we love our cricket in Australia. That was all okay. And yeah. you're doing very well. I'm impressed with that, Jeff. Okay. You know, so so it's it was a it was a fun book to write. I just added, like I said, five chapters to it to rebrand it, and it's uh it's 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 really for anybody in any type of sales. It's not just for service advisors, for anybody in sales, leadership, or management. You know, where the other book, uh, you know, write service, write your own paycheck. The rest of that title is uh, the, uh, how to make a hundred thousand dollars a year when writing service. And we're we're updating that book here next, and and the new cap cover is going to say how to make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars writing service because that's becoming very common over here if you do the job right. I have to ask you about uh, racing, motor racing. So uh, sure. Formula One is coming to Las Vegas uh, this sure. year. Uh, uh -huh. is, does it cross over for you or is it really Indy 500? Do you, do you see the Formula One, any interest there at all? Or 
Oh, no. oh sure. You know, I mean, it's it's open will. So, you know, I, I keep my eye on and eye on it. And I, you know, I followed it a little bit. I think it's, you know, obviously those those cars are way more technically advanced than the Indy car is because you have the different uh, manufacturers coming in and literally building the car from the ground up. So that's exciting to see what's going on going on there. But the Indy cars. And, and and I don't know if I'll if I'll be able to make it to uh, the Las Vegas race or not. I did go to the ones they had at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway a few years mm -hmm. back, so I find it very very exciting. What gets it? And, and so I have nothing negative to say about Formula One, um, but what gets me excited about Indianapolis is even though the cars are pretty much all the same, it's mm -hmm. either a Honda or it's a Chevrolet. It really gets down to the driver. I mean, it gets down to the driver. Of, and I'm not saying that Formula One drivers yeah. aren't great because many of them have come over to Indianapolis and and, and won it all the way back to the Jimmy Clark days, you know. Mm. Um, but but uh, the Indy, the speed, you know, you, the, the 230 miles an hour. They're coming down the straight before they go on the first turn. They're going 241 miles an hour. That's a that's a football field every seven tenths of a second. You know what I mean? Mm. And they're they're will to will whatever. So mm. uh, it's and you never know who's going to win an indie 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 car race. I mean, mm. there's there's you know anywhere from twenty five to thirty three car drivers on the grid, and literally anybody can win that race. But you know, again, I've been to to several uh, Formula One events over the years. I'm sure I'll go to more. And and you hear that high pitch whine and you yeah. know you see how fast they are going in the corners and the skill it takes there. You know. Yeah, yeah. Is the sport of all type? It, it, and business, you can take so many lessons that we learn in sport into business in all ways. Oh you, oh, you, oh, you can. I mean, you just take a look at the drivers, you know, from Ford, you know, one or the other. I mean, they have to negotiate their their contracts, you know, and, yeah. and there's never and I don't care what form of racing it is. It's very, very rare. I can only think of one or two times that somebody put a driver in the car that they didn't like. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that driver has to hit with that that team owner and, and they have to build that rapport. They have to build that relationship, you know, just like you do in sales. And then and then when they once they get the vehicle, they have to prove they've got the skill to handle the vehicle. And then once they prove they can handle the vehicle, then they have to prove that they have the right to keep driving. And how do you do that? You win, you know, yeah. and how but do you I, win? the flip side of that, I'm sure you've seen lots of drivers leave a team because they didn't gel with the team. And right. a great driver. So yeah, it is people again. And that's and that's what that's what I love about auto racing versus mm. so many other sports is is it's is you either you're either winning mm. or you're or you're not driving the car. I mean, and, and so what, what we're talking about here is accountability. Okay. Mm. I put you in that seat because I expected you to do X and you did it, so you get to keep driving. I put you in that seat and you didn't do X, and so you can't drive it anymore because I gotta get somebody in there to do it. And it, it's the same thing, it's, it seems harsh. But that's one of the missing things when it comes to writing service in the service mm. department is, is number one, we don't train them. And then even if we do, we don't hold them accountable to do things like like everybody knows that walking around a customer's vehicle at the initial write up is the smartest thing you can do. If you're not doing it, you start doing it. It's an immediate a half hour per reporter. You're going to increase just like that, you know, mm. just like that. But nobody does it. And, the, and when you ask managers, you say, well, why, how come your people? Well, they said they don't really want to do it. Or, you know, if I press them to do it, then, you know, they might quit. Mm. So what? I mean, if you build a winning team and you're able to, I mean, what, what's better to run an ad and say we need service advisors because we can't keep them or run an ad and say we need another service advisor to our team because our team is growing at a, at a, at a point it's unbelievable. We write three hours per repair order when the national average is 1.3. Effective labor rate 92% when the national average is 68%. Perfect survey scores. We win awards. You know, when you, when you can run an ad with those kind of numbers, what you're telling everybody is, is we're the winning team. Mm. People want to work for the winning team. So well, I wanted to ask you, you've you've seen lots of service managers, lots of um, service advisors in the industry, in lots of different countries, a lot of time in Australia, uh, Canada, of course, the US. And um, can I ask you, what separates the good from the greats? Is there any character traits, anything that you walk in and you say, oh, this, they have got it nailed down there? Anything that really separates them? You, you When you're talking about advisors? Uh, service department, the whole department. Oh, yeah, Sure. It's it's the people it's the people that understand what the opportunity is, and it's the people mm -hmm. walk in and say, "Oh, hey, look, you know, it's important that we're a family because we're going to spend more time together than we do with our families. It's important that we have fun. It's important that it's 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 a fun place to be." But at the end of the day, the person with their name on the sign wants us to get maximum performance out of this. And so I went to school as a manager. I went to meetings. I read articles. I'm up to date with everything's going on. And there are people out there that are clearly getting higher numbers than us. Mm -hmm. And so the question isn't if it can be done or not, because there's people out there proving it can be. The question is, is how did they do it? And how can we do it? And then once we do it, how can we do it better? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the kind of mindset. And then you get a person that does that, 
and they say, okay, hey, look, I figured this out. This is what we got to do to get these numbers. And so now I've got to find people that want to do that, that can do that, and are comfortable with me holding them accountable to do that. And 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 so I, I it's, it's the people that think like that, because what happens, at least over here stateside and in Canada and Australia, and I'll do respect to people that are working out there, um, you know, you can get in the car business over here with zero college mm -hmm. education. I don't have a college education, so I'm not putting anybody down that doesn't have one. So you take a young guy, a young gal, you put them in a service department at 20 years old. They didn't even think they were going to make 30000 a year. Now they're averaging 75000 And so what that does is that creates a real complacency thing. You know, no, mm -hmm. why, why should I go out there and do that? I'm already making you know, three times what I thought I'd be able to make in life. Instead of looking at it like, hey, I'm making 75000 but the guy sitting down there, he's making 125000 and I'm on the same drive, same manager, same manufacturer, same tech, same parts. Uh, uh, so the only thing that's different between him making under 25 and me making the 70 I'm making is me. So what can I do different to make that 125? You know, it's it's being serious about what you're doing and understanding the opportunity and 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 what's at stake and and mm -hmm. and uh, and not becoming complacent. And even when you went, okay, so now I've matched that guy down there. He's making 125. Can I can I do something more without twisting arms, without pushing people, without selling things that don't need to be sold? Is there something I can do better to get to 130, 140, 150? Mm. That's what I that's what I did when I started out. When I went in the when I went into the service department, I went in there. The first thing I did is I took a look around. And at the time, you know, we're talking 36, you know, 38 years ago. So that was, you know, that was a long time ago, you know. And but but at the time, you know, the, making fifty thousand dollars a year was a lot of money. And mm. I went in there and I saw that most of the people were making 30 or less, but there was a guy making 50. So mm. the first week, all I did is I was writing services. I watched this guy, what he did, what he said, what he, how he did it. And I matched him tit for tat. And by the end of the third week, I was making what he was making. And mm. I took a look at it and said, this guy's making this and he's really not selling anything. Where, where would the opportunity be? So I started walking around cars and pointing things out. I started asking for the money. I started doing better follow-up, follow-up cars, the calls. I started explaining everything to everybody. You know, this is, this is what you need. And I, and I wasn't afraid to ask for it. And I, and I, you know, back then when he, when the, when it was an insane for somebody to make fifty, I was knocking out eighty, ninety thousand a year, and I wasn't pushing people, I wasn't twisting arms, I wasn't selling stuff that didn't need to be done. I just was doing the job, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there, that's that's one of the things that's that's missing. It. And but but you can attract people like that, you know. If you if you're a leader and you've got that same mindset, then people that have that same mindset are attracted to you. They want to be around you. It's something I've learned all the time coming to the uh, NADA conference, and uh, I think 22 of them I've done now there. So uh, you've spoken 23 of them. And in the American market, the amount of commission for a service advisor would seem huge compared to, say, uh, the UK Irish market there. And so many times um, some of the people listening to this will go, wow, uh, we don't do that at all. It's just really a salary base. Uh, the guys might make a bit of a tickle on if they have good customer satisfaction scores or if they um, it might be a minute thing. So it really is seen as a sales operation there in the American market. And I think it should be. It really should be. Yeah, that I, I, I it it it. It should be, you know, if you, if you, it's because it's, it's no different than selling the car. I mean, if you yeah. want, if you want people that are going to be motivated to do it, you have to give them a reason to be motivated. Yeah. You know, salary, salary, I got to be careful saying this because I don't want to mm. make anybody mad, but, but, you know, salary in a sales position creates complacency and laziness. Yeah. You know, if, uh, I go out here, if I go out here and if I, if I sell a hundred thousand this month or I sell 50,000 this month, I'm going to get the same amount of money. So why would I want to get off my chair? Mm. Yep, that, that's exactly it. Uh, the other thing, what advice do you have for a service advisor that um, makes the decision for the customer? Um, and there's a story here. I, I was in a business recently and I was listening to a call, doing some coaching with a lady. She just started in the business. Uh, not her fault, really good. Uh, but this technician had uh, identified a lot of um, red and amber work that had to be sold on the vehicle health check. The electronic vehicle health check, again, you have them out there. And she made the decision for the customer, okay? And what I mean by that, uh, the, the customer had three millimeters of tread on it. The legal limit in the UK and Ireland is 1.6. Sorry, I don't know what that is in the... Um, <laughs> but but it, the same. It, yeah, exactly. So, um, and she just made a decision where she said to the customer on the phone, oh, listen, your tires are wearing, so you need to sort them soon. I was like, no, 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 no. We need to tell the customer what the issue is if you don't replace those tires you're doubling your braking distance on a wet road actually it's 
five double-decker buses, extra stopping distance. Let the customer make an educated decision as opposed to an ignorant risk. But talking about it, she decided, but Simon, it's a lot of money really, isn't it? And I, I realized it was a lot of money for her. She didn't. Do you have any advice where people make that decision? You must see it all the time, don't you? Where people oh, are making a decision for the customer. Oh, oh yeah. And, and, and I, and I, and I kind of side with the advisors because I've noticed something that happens with advisors. You bring an advisor in, they've never written service. They don't know anything about cars. They don't mm -hmm. know much about the automotive industry, but within three to six months, they develop a sixth sense. And Simon, I've never seen anything like it. They're able to look at somebody and tell how much money they have in the bank. <laughs> yeah. And, and they even develop an ability to second guess their technicians who spend a hundred thousand dollars to go to school and sitting on fifty thousand dollars with the tools in three months, they can second guess that guy, even though they've never even picked up a wrench and probably don't even know what one is. So obviously I'm being sarcastic. Yeah. So yeah. The, the thing is, is 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 this this kind of goes back to what we were talking about a second it, 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 again as well. It's it's not being complacent. So so let's let me start with that. So, okay, so you're not on commission, you're doing it for salary. Do you want to move up? Okay, mm -hmm. if you want to move yeah. up, who do they get to select when it comes to move up? The best service advisor there is. Yes. Do you want job security? Because in COVID over here, let me tell you, when COVID hit, you know, the average service drive had four service advisors. The first thing car dealerships did around here is they said, we got to get rid of 25% of our people. Guess which service advisor they let go? Oh, the yes. one who wasn't producing. All right, so that's that. So here's what I tell service advisors. Your job is not to be a financial advisor. It, it makes no difference how much money this customer has. It, that's not even up to you. What the customer did, and if, if your audience can get their head wrapped around what I'm getting ready to say right here, they'll increase their sales by 25 to 50% overnight. And I'm being conservative. And that's this. Understand that when a customer comes into you, whether they're asking for service, a repair, they're asking for maintenance, no matter what they're asking for, there, there's one question. And it's all the same thing. The question is this, what will it take to make my vehicle perfect? Hmm. That's the only question. What will it take to make my vehicle perfect? What will it take to make my vehicle perfect? And the only answer an advisor should ever give is this much money in this much time. Oh, really? Well, how, what will it take to make my vehicle perfect? This much money and this much time. Well, how about my vehicle? This much money and this much time. Well, gee, I don't know if I've got that much, much money or that much time. Then Mr. Customer, how close to perfect do you want your vehicle? You see, you never take anything off the ticket. Your job is to, is to when you're walking around the car to point, you know ask them what they came in for, and then on top of that walk around the car and if you see anything out of the ordinary you point it out, mm -hmm. you, know, you give your vehicle to the, the technician and the technician looks it over comes back with his report everything that's on there you tell that customer you let them make the mm -hmm. decision because some and it's 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 more important now that you do that than any other time in the automotive history here's why COVID changed everything. Before before COVID, people used to think of maintenance and repairs as a necessary evil. Nobody wanted to do it, right? Well, today, you know, when, when COVID hit, I think everybody understood very, very quickly within just a number of days that there was that 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 we were one teleconference away from losing all public transportation, all airplanes, all buses, all boats, all cars, all taxis, all all all, all Uber, Lyft was all be gone. So if I was going to be able to get to my the grocery store and fight for my share of toilet paper, mm -hmm. I had to get there. So what's the only way I can get there? My car. I mean, the way that people talk about cars before COVID was how much is this going to cost me? How long do you have to have the car? Can I get it back by the end of the day? Now they're coming in and saying, what type of investment am I looking at? And how long will you need to keep my car for to make sure that it's done right? Mm, sure. and, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's why? Because they know that the car is now important. And now it's become the most important thing for a customer uh, is in their life is their car. And and number two, they're keeping them longer. And they know they're going to. Going into COVID stateside, the average age of a car was 11.8 years. Right now, it's only been three years. It's up to 12.8 years. And the NADA is predicting that within another 12 to 18 months, it will be over 13 years. These customers are keeping these cars. They see it as an investment. And your job is just to find out everything that's not perfect on the car. Mm. Let the customer make, like you said, an informed decision, an intelligent decision. If they want it, great, write it up. If they don't want it, at least they know. That just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free 
trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.